The Holy Gospel according to John, the 20th chapter, the 19th through the 23rd verse. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. The gospel of Christ praise to you, O Christ. Let us pray, Lord, let the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. I want to speak very briefly from the thought, the day fire fell from heaven. Long ago and far away, the ancients thought that the number one sign of life was in the breath. If a body was breathing, it was alive. That's why in Genesis, we see that God formed a humanoid being But that being, uh, that human was not actually alive until God breathed into that human's nostrils. With the inhale and the exhale, there was the signal that this wasn't just some dummy made of clay. This being, this human being was alive. Same thing when we fast forward a little bit, picture it. Ezekiel's in the valley of dry bones. The bones are exceedingly dry. Over time, the Spirit of God puts muscle and connective tissue onto those dry bones, but they aren't alive just yet. They look like humans. They have been rebuilt from dry, dry bones, but they aren't alive just yet. What happens next? I'm glad you asked. God tells Ezekiel to prophesy to the winds, the ruach, to fill the lungs of the remade human, suddenly the wind of God comes from every different location and fills the bodies, and now they are alive. (sighs) Inhale, (sighs) exhale, (sighs) inhale, (sighs) exhale. We don't really think about it until we have to inhale, exhale, signs of life. Now, We know that one has to have brain and heart function as well, but if you'll humor me, we can also say that the ancients were right in that we also have to have respiration, breathing to live. We don't really think about it until we have to. Then came COVID-19, the breath stealer, the asphyxiator, COVID-19. If we didn't have to consider our breathing before, we certainly do now. COVID is a debilitating disease that has overtaken this world. Our city has been ravaged by it. It is a thing that nightmares are made of. It has attacked both the weak and the strong, the rich and the poor. It has destroyed bodies and still claims lives while I speak. We don't really think about our breathing until all of a sudden. We have to. For many reasons, black and brown people have to think about it in a different way. We know that more black and brown people are dying and have died from this disease. A little over a month ago now, the Surgeon General came online and basically said that black and brown people are dying in numbers that were far greater than white people. And he, in a very veiled way, said, well, the black and brown people are just unhealthy and they don't know how to follow the rules of social distancing. I remember how livid I was because he was speaking of the surface issues, but did not properly deal with the systematic nature of why black and brown people are more susceptible to COVID. I don't really have enough time to explain. It's another sermon for another day, but you can simply Google it. There are some good articles online about the systems that have exacerbated the negative effects of COVID on black and brown bodies. So we are all in the midst of a traumatic pandemic. And to add insult on top of injury, it seems that racism has not distanced itself from black people. On February 23rd, 2020, unarmed 25-year-old Armand Arbery was jogging in a neighborhood in South Georgia when three white men got in the trucks, hunted him for four minutes, and after catching up with him, shot him at near point blank range with shotguns. The law enforcement did nothing until national outcry reached a fevered pitch some 10 weeks later, and it wasn't local law enforcement. 
Because the man who killed Armad was a former cop, the local police department sought to protect him from charges. An outside state law enforcement agency is the one that brought the charges. On March 11, 2020, in the middle of the night, Brianna Taylor was sleeping in her house. The police secured a no-knock warrant where they don't announce themselves, they just break in, and they broke into her house. Her boyfriend, who thought that someone was breaking in, fired a couple of shots toward police as a warning, and Brianna, an unarmed black woman who was an EMT and aspiring nurse, was shot eight times. Then her boyfriend was charged with attempted murder. While all charges against him were later dropped, there was hardly zero coverage over this. A few days ago, on May 25th, George Floyd was arrested for using counterfeit money in Minneapolis, Minnesota. For nine minutes while he was in custody, a police officer kneeled directly on his neck, despite his cries that he could not breathe. Despite the cries of the people who were witnessing the event, George Floyd cried out for his mother. He was treated like an animal in the moment. What we now know from other footage uh, is that George was being beat while in the police car before he was crushed on the ground and that at some point, it wasn't just one man on his neck, but three people pinning his body to the ground. Four officers were fired the next day. It took several days to arrest the officer, pinning Floyd's neck, and even that was done with hesitation. You don't have to think about your breathing until you do. And for me and others, we think about our breathing constantly. On that same day, right in Central Park, in New York City, Amy Cooper was asked to leash her dog by a black man. She refused, and when he persisted, she told him, I'm going to call the cops on you. And what did she do? Just that. She not only called the police and told them that there was a man threatening me and my dog, but she said, there was a black man threatening me and my dog. Amy knew something that all black people have known for a long time. The police can be used and weaponized against black bodies. Back in the 1800s and even before, policing outfits were often in cahoots with night Riders and the KKK and other forms of white vigilante uh, militia, and these strands still exist in forms today. Shootings of black people. Bodies been being policed by officials and unofficials. The treatment of blacks as worse than animals still has not been reckoned with even to this day. We see how bodies are lynched all the day long, and we are always aware of it. Our bodies are policed, are always being smacked down, back down into our second class places. And as a result, on this Pentecost Sunday, we see embers of fire falling from heaven. Cities are burning from centuries of disappointment, from centuries of being expendable. There is fire falling down from heaven amidst calls to be respectable and nonviolent, to stay in our place and protest respectably. There is fire falling down from heaven, disruptive fire, fire after which nothing can ever be the same, Pentecost fire. Buildings are being burned down because the only thing America seems to react to is when its pocket has been attacked. No. Black people aren't destroying bodies as has been done to them. They are attacking hierarchical systems of power which have relegated them to always think about their breathing and how easily and readily the society is willing to look the other way when the breath of the black body stops. If COVID doesn't get me, maybe this evil form of body policing will, and it doesn't matter if I'm a good or bad black, before I open my mouth, my skin has already spoken for me. This is America. This is not an aberration or a conspiracy. This is not political spin or fake news. This is America, the land of the conditionally free in the home, of the selectively brave. And then I have to convince the world that my life matters. As soon as a black person is killed, there are attempts to discredit that body, to make it seem less than human, because if somebody can make you see me as less than human or criminal, then it shifts the blame off of the oppressor and on to the oppressed. The black body is pinned between 16, 19, and COVID-19, a rock and a hard place. You don't have to think about breathing until you have to. It hurts to be hunted. We can't breathe. We're tired, we're heartbroken. There are so many forces that want to stop the breath of the black body. We can't breathe, I said. 
And when we do breathe, it can only be in a few anxiety-ridden gasps at a time. When we get into our gospel lesson, we see a people who have been hunted. The disciples of Jesus are still being hunted. The Romans are seeking the last of the Jesus movement to stamp it out. When we find the disciples, they are huddled away, quarantined. They are waiting for news of Jesus. Apparently he who has been murdered by the state as a common criminal was alive again. And the disciples amidst their anxiety, amidst their fear of death, amidst their fears that someone would come and extinguish their own breath, were waiting. And Jesus came in the midst of them and said, peace be with you. I guess that it's possible to still have peace in the middle of the pandemic, even when your life is in danger. Jesus comes in. We don't go to Jesus, but Jesus comes to us right in our place of trouble. Oh, what grace. Then Jesus says, peace be with you. And then he breathes on them. Here you have these marginalized disciples who are breathing in anxious gulps of air, just trying to make it from moment to moment. Here you have these folks who feel as if they could be killed at any moment and Jesus breathes on them. Yes, Jesus, the one who has just been breathless. The murdered one is the one who is breathing on the disciples. When Jesus was crucified, his lungs filled up with fluid until he could no longer breathe. The beating and blood loss was bad enough, but a crucifixion was a death by choking. Life was literally choked out of Jesus on the cross. His innocent body was choked on the cross until it was lifeless. Yes, Jesus is the asphyxiated one. This one whom the disciples had just seen crucified and who had died a horrendous death with all of the accompanying spectacle is supplying the breath of God for those whose breath has been threatened by society. Jesus breathes on them and with them. Jesus breathes in spite of the murderous intent that surrounds the disciples. His breathing, he is breathing on them while danger yet lurks and while they are still in quarantine. Jesus is breathing on anxious, scared, heartbroken people. Jesus is breathing. Inhale. Exhale. Inhale. Exhale. I'm so glad that Jesus breathes on us still. When I can't breathe for myself, when my heart is overwhelmed, when I've been marginalized for whatever reason, Jesus comes among us in the midst of our quarantine. He pronounces peace and he breathes on us. He gives us life in the midst of impending death. And since the grave was unable to hold his body down, we can trust that this wind of God is resilient. It can't be stopped. It cannot be legislated against. It finds us in our most needy place. It soothes our doubts and calms our fears. It gives us hope that there will be a better tomorrow. As the fire falls down from heaven, we must never forget that Jesus is breathing and spurring us to keep on working, keep advocating, keep pushing to speak up for ourselves and our neighbors. Jesus is breathing with us, the church, on this Pentecost Sunday so that we can live into who we are to be. Jesus is breathing in Minneapolis. Jesus is breathing in South Georgia. Jesus is breathing in Louisville, Kentucky. Jesus is breathing in New York City. Jesus is breathing on the streets where protest is happening and fire is falling. Jesus is breathing right here in my house. Jesus is breathing with us in the midst of our fear and in spite of all of the pain and uncertainty. Jesus is breathing and pronouncement of the Holy Spirit gives us strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow. Breathe on us, breath of God. Fill us with life anew. Jesus not only breathes to give peace, but also spurs us on toward action. I had a whole other sermon about forgiving and retaining sins from this same text. but We ain't got time for that. I'll have to come back and preach a part two sometime. The Holy Spirit spurs us out of our places of dread toward action. Jesus breathed on the disciples to prepare them to be the church 
by proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. Rudolf Bultmann suggests that every proclamation moment should bring about a moment of decision, a crisis. In this crisis moment, we must choose and we must help others to choose. Maybe it is our job to proclaim the gospel, not only with our mouths, but with our feet. And what gospel is this that we must proclaim? The one where Jesus says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor, to heal the brokenhearted, to pre preach deliverance to the captives, the recovery of sight to the blind, to set the oppressed free and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. What are we doing to accomplish this? Jesus chose the side of the oppressed. What side will we choose? Today, I was originally supposed to be preaching at one of our churches in honor of confirmation, and I did end up preaching there. And confirmation is the day in our church where we celebrate the members of our church crossing into adult responsibility. Even though the church didn't end up having the right of confirmation today because the bottom of the world has fallen out and has uh, shifted all kinds of things, the confirmands were still all participating in worship online, giving thanks, praying and admonishing the country for its blind eye towards white supremacy and racism. And I'm sure that when it's safe, they'll be invited to have their cake and punch and they'll get their presents. But we can take note of something from what they were doing today. Those confirmands were participating in worship, seeking to be a balm in this world, becoming leaders of the church and world. Ceremony is important, but what was most important in the faith walk of those children was how their faith was speaking. One day they'll have the cake and punch and ceremony, but that day will fade in their memory. And the question is for all of us, after the ceremony, what does our faith look like? Some of us affirmed our faith a long time ago, but what are we doing? Do we hide behind demands to be respectable? Or do we govern ourselves like Jesus who turned the world on its head? Do we sit from our places of privilege and chastise others for making us look bad? Or do, do we join in the fight for justice? Jesus is breathing upon us today to be church. Can we take a page out of the Conferman's book and be faithful even when things don't go as planned? Will we still look like God's children in the world? Jesus is breathing. Jesus is calling. On the day fire fell from heaven in Acts, there was a major disruption. There came a time when things would never be the same. And in the middle of all of this disruption today, there still comes the stirring in our hearts for God to breathe on us, in us, with us, and in spite of us. Amen.